Welcome to today's PDAC webinar, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Private Investment in Public Equity, Pipes, But We're Afraid to Ask, which is the third of our 16 sessions in the FASCIN series. My name is Virginia Schweitzer, and I'm the co-managing partner in FASCIN's Ottawa office and a member of the PDAC program committee. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. At the end of the webinar, please click the survey link underneath the video to fill in our survey. Your input is greatly appreciated. During the webinar, if you have a question, please type your question into the chat box beside the video. Today's panel will do their best to answer all the questions they can. If you require technical support, please click the tech FAQs or tech support chat which is located under the question chat box. The speaker's bios from today's webinar can be access accessed from the materials button under the video player. This webinar is also being broadcast on YouTube Live. And now I'll turn things over for the main event to Gesta Abels, who is a partner in our Toronto office and the co-leader of the US practice, and Nicole Park, who is a partner in our Toronto office in the M&A group. Great, thank you. And uh, we're delighted to be here and appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to us talk about pipes. Um, and so we, we're gonna go over now just a quick overview of what we're gonna do. And really we've bifurcated uh, the presentation into an overview of pipes. And we're gonna get into some of the legal nitty gritty about what they are and what the legal and regulatory considerations are. And Nicole is going to sort of take the lead on that. And then I, once we're through that and we can, we can try to address questions in real time, we've saved some time at the end for Q and a, but once we're through the nuts and bolts about what a pipe is, we'll get to the results of our study, our second annual uh, deal point study, which tries to address the question of what's market. Um, what's market doesn't always answer the question in terms of what should be for a deal, but where there's, uh, it can help set expectations and it can also get you through an impasse uh, where parties may have sort of polar opposite views as to what should be and we can look, look to what's market. And, and so not only will we talk about what our results are, but also to understand some of the uh, strengths and limitations of our, of our study uh, and the sample size. Um, and then at the end, we talk a little bit about mining specific related issues. Some of that will have already been addressed, but we thought we'd try to regroup and, and circle in on that. And then we'll deal with any questions that, that haven't been asked. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Nicole and uh, we'll get into you know, what's a pipe and what some of the legal issues are. Great, thank you, Gesta. Good yeah. afternoon, everyone. Um, as Gessa noted, that I'm going to go through a little bit of an overview of what a pipe is, you know, what kind of terms are negotiated, the process behind a pipe, and some regulatory considerations. Uh, as noted, feel free to shoot us a question in our chat, and we'll try to answer them in real time, but otherwise, um, we'll definitely try to get through them all by the end of the presentation. So, what is a pipe? Pipe stands for Private Investment in Public Equity. As the name kind of describes, this is just a sale of securities from a public company through a private transaction, like a private placement, rather than through a public offering. Usually this involves one investor or a small targeted group of investors. The types of investors can range from private equity firms to institutional investors, such as pension plans and funds. Um, or strategic investors, such as a customer who, you know, may want to acquire a minority interest in a particular reporting issuer. We're also seeing some sovereign wealth funds and other investors from emerging markets, such as China, interested in making minority investments in particular industries in Canada, such as mining and natural resources. So Next slide. Uh, yeah, if I'll just jump in. Uh, yeah. One thing is what a pipe isn't, and it, and it speaks to the actual deal study and what we look at. So, I mean, it's not just a basic private placement, which I'm sure many of our uh, web uh, watchers are familiar with. Uh, we're talking about generally a larger size and also to a limited, perhaps just one investor. 
So your, your typical, you know, smaller public company trying to raise money, going out to friends and family, that is not what we're talking about here. It, 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 it's usually a significant investment by one or a handful of investors. And the other thing we're not talking about, um, which is timely, and maybe in next year's study, we'll see, you know, how, how the world has evolved is we're not talking about SPAC transactions. Now, frankly, there aren't that many pure Canadian SPACs out there right now, but what we're seeing in the US, and if you look to US data, you know, it's, it's the hottest thing going. And in their de spacking transaction where they identify a target, because so much money comes out of the SPAC and they have to raise it, there's usually a pipe done at that time. That's not in our data. And, that, and I think there are different considerations that some of what you're going to hear about, and certainly in terms of the legal, would be applicable, but that's not our focus uh, for today. Over to okay. you. Thanks, Gesta. So that definitely leads us into the next slide. So why would you want to do a pipe transaction? Um, they're definitely attractive from both the company perspective as well as the investor perspective. Let's just take a look at the company perspective first. So they're generally faster and more effective ways to raise capital, um, and they're usually done at a lower cost. This is because, again, these are done through usually a private placement under applicable securities laws and relying on an exemption. Typically, we see this as being the accredited investor exemption. Therefore, no prospectus is required. So that just immediately takes away that kind of main disclosure document takes time and costs money. Um, the pipes also don't have as strict filing timelines as a public offering. And they have limited involvement with regulators in comparison to a public offering. A real highlight of doing a pipe transaction is the flexibility of design. So a company can actually think about what kind of investment they want and tailor it to their needs. And this is, again, because as Gessen noted, it's usually one investor we're talking about or a very small targeted group of investors. So you know, there's less people at the table to negotiate with. Uh, another reason why someone, would, a company would want to do a pipe transaction is perhaps a public offering is just not really on the table for them. It may be a smaller issuer and they just don't have access to those large institutional investors, um, you know, those big pension funds um, due to their low market cap, cap and a small trading float. Also, as noted earlier, that the public offering is, you know, maybe cost prohibitive. So a small issuer just may not, you know, may not be realistic for them to do one. And what we're really seeing, you know, especially in the pandemic or COVID, you know, if a, a company is financially distressed, they, they may want to, you know, access capital through a pipe transaction. Um, this is a way for them to get some maybe equity investment to improve their balance sheet. Yeah. And on that one, and it will come up later when we talk about mining, it, it's a, it's, it can be a good way of bringing in a strategic partner. Um, and without putting the company up for sale as well. So, so you, you, you're, you, and we'll see in the data, you may be sort of giving up some control, but you're not, you're not actually entering into a change of control transaction. So where, you know, capital is scarce and needs are, are very real, a pipe can be a, a, a nice way of sort of threading the needle and balancing those sort of competing interests and where, where you don't think it's a time to look to a, a real change of control option. Totally. Now let's consider things from the investor side. What makes this attractive to an investor? Well, some of the similar reasons is that it, you know, it gives them an opportunity to get to the table and negotiate with an issuer on getting specific rights um, and governance. Uh, you know, they can get some governance rights as well as investor favorable rights, such as like a preemptive right. Uh, it also gives them a chance to get a substantial amount of equity at a, a discount relative to the issuer's current market price. So, you know, these both are very attractive characteristics of a pipe transaction for an investor. So what does a pipe consist of? Um, so there's multiple types of, you know, securities we see that can be issued as in connection with a pipe transaction. One of the most common ones is common shares. This would be, you know, the issuer's preferred type of security to issue to an investor in a pipe transaction. Uh, you often see preferred shares. Uh, these will likely be convertible for common shares. And this will be more desirable from an investor perspective because they will carry preferential dividends um, and they often have you know, liquidation preferences um, in addition to having the ability then to you know, convert it in a good time to common shares. 
another type of security that could be issued in connection with a pipe are bonds or debentures. These are often unsecured. Um, and, and similar to the PREF shares, they they're usually carry a you know, conversion right into common shares. And these are, again, uh, you know, desirable by investors. They don't carry dividends, but they, you know, they'll carry interest payments. Um, and they often include you know, priority rights over equity securities in certain circumstances. Lastly, you may see some warrants being issued. Um, and, and these are often granted by the, the company as an inducement to the transaction. As I noted earlier, you know, the, the big reason and big benefit from both sides of the table um, with pipes is the flexibility in the design of the investment. Um, this is due to the large, you know, the types and multitude of terms that can be negotiated. How these terms play out will really depend on the bargaining power between the parties um, and the particular circumstances of the, the issuer. Um, also, you, you know, obviously pricing plays a key point in, in the terms to be negotiated, but we need to be mindful of the applicable exchange rules where the, the securities are listed. Um, we'll get more into exchange rules and regulatory requirements later, but that's something that will obviously play into the negotiation of pricing. So with that, let's talk about pricing. Um, so common shares, the, the key pricing term to be negotiated is the price per common share. Uh, we typically see these being granted at a discount um, to the market price, but usually within line with the uh, approved discounts under the TSX rules or the, the applicable exchange rules. Uh, for com you know, convertible PREF shares, the key pricing term to be negotiated is the conversion rate and the conversion price premium, um, and as well as the, the dividend rate. So the conversion premium, uh, sorry, the, the purchase, the conversion rate and conversion payment is usually negotiated at a premium to the current market price. Um, the higher the premium on the conversion rate, usually the investor will re you know, request a higher dividend rate. And the reason for that is that you know, the investor will likely have to hold on to that convertible security for a longer period as they wait for that, you know, the, the market price to creep higher than the conversion rate. Um, similar to convertible PREF shares, uh, convertible debentures or bonds, the negotiated terms are, again, the conversion price, um, as well as the interest rate instead of the dividend rates, the interest rate. So that's kind of how they're, they're equivalent. And again, if the higher the conversion price premium, the higher the interest rate that's gonna be expected from the investor. For warrants, the, the key price in terms to be negotiated would be the, uh, the exercise price and the term of the warrant. Well, we typically see the term of the warrant being between one to, the, one to three years. So the other terms to be negotiated that you may you know, see pop up in a pipe transaction are uh, anti-dilution anti uh, provisions and protections. Investors will want this if they have, they're getting issued convertible PREF shares, convertible bonds or warrants. And this is to protect the value of their investment in event of, you know, the issuer does certain things such as, you know, there's changes to the capital structure where they, you know, subdivide or, you know, consolidate the issued outstanding common shares of that issuer. Um, if there's some sort of distribution of additional common shares by a stock dividend, or if the issuer starts issuing options or stock purchase rights or a warrants at a, you know, a discount that's less than the, the permitted discount. How these anti-dilution provisions usually um, are accomplished, it's usually by an adjustment mechanism of the conversion and exercise price, or, you know, the number of shares issuable upon the exercise will also get adjusted. Another um, negotiated term will be that, you know, the investor may ask for some favorable rights that they may acquire as in connection with their investment. Um, uh, you know, a common one we see is preemptive rights. This is a right for the investor to participate in, you know, additional security offerings of that issuer. Um, and this will be just to protect their like proportional ownership of the issuer on a go forward basis. The company and, you know, if they're going to grant one of these preemptive rights, they may still want to, you know, carve out some ability to issue shares without triggering that preemptive right. Um, for example, if there's an equity incentive plan where they, you know, want to be able to issue, continue to issue options to their employees or management, uh, they would obviously want to carve that out so that not each time they issue options, they have to go trigger this preemptive right. Another thing we see investors asking for are governance rights. These can take the form of a director nomination right. Uh, how many nomination rights they get will depend on, again, usually how much they're going to be investing and how much ownership they'll have with the company. 
Uh, this may be like a right that's just a direct right. Um, there can also be negotiations on when these new rights come into place. So like if, for example, the issuer doesn't, fails to make payment of the dividends under their convertible uh, to venture pref shares, sorry, under their convertible pref shares, then they may trigger one of these director nomination rights and then they can continue to do, you know, hold a, a member on the board. Um, if, depending on the bargaining power of the investor, they may even be able to, you know, negotiate for nomination rights of specific committee members. And, and that would be something for like a financial committee. So, there, you know, the, the availability of terms here, you know, is limitless. Um, the other, the other possible, you know, governance right that an investor may negotiate for are approval rights or consent rights over certain actions done by the issuer. Uh, these, usually these are like fundamental fundamental corporate decisions, such as like amending the constant documents, the articles, bylaws of the issuer, if the issuer is going to issue new classes of shares, if they're going to do some debt issuances. But they can also be things like, you know, if the issuer wants to enter into a new business line, perhaps that needs to be consented by the investor, or their annual business plan has to be put in front of the investor each year, and they have a right to like approve it. Um, Another typical one you see would be, you know, whether the issuer can do a, you know, major acquisition or a disposition of assets. And um, usually that's set up at some sort of monetary threshold. But, but you can see in the mining space where you could have uh, rights over specific assets and in terms of committees, it may not be at the board, but you may have the right to be on a technical committee, for example, or, or other things. So there is, there is a, a wide range of options as Nicole mentioned. And, you know, the, the more that the investment smells and feels like a, a, a joint venture without actually being one, or perhaps that's also negotiated at the same time, you know, the more of these rights that are going to be present and, and relevant. Definitely, definitely. Um, another, you know, investor right that may be negotiated for our prospectus qualification rights. And this would be a right to, you know, essentially create liquidity opportunities where resale opportunities may be just, you know, deemed to be limited here, or just to alleviate the fear uh, of liquidity for that investor. Um, you know, we see these commonly granted in the U.S. market, and, and that's probably, there's, there's reasons for that. Like, typically their whole periods are longer than ours, and they have more stringent resale restrictions on private placements than here in Canada. But, you know, often our invest the investors in these pipe transactions in Canada may be a U.S. private equity firm. They're used to getting these types of rights. So, you know, typically issuers are, are generally okay with um, putting in one of these covenants to undertake an underwritten secondary offering qualified under prospectus here in Canada, which is kind of the equivalent to a, you know, a, a reg you know, prospectus qualification registration right in the U.S. Um, when granting, it should a you know issuer grant all these like very favorable rights to an investor, they may want to have some ability to pull back. So an issuer could negotiate for a right to terminate one or more of these investor favorable rights, should the investor's you know ownership of the issuer you know fall below a certain threshold. Now, what would the issuer want, uh, and what could they potentially negotiate for that are like special rights? Um, you know, issuer would probably want some sort of protections. Uh, some of the more common ones negotiated for are standstills. Um, a standstill could take the form of where like an investor agrees to not acquire any additional securities of the issuer or maybe not acquire more beyond a certain threshold of ownership percentage. Or um, a stand could, standstill could also, you know, require the investor to agree to not engage in any hostile actions against the issuer such as like a proxy contest to, you know, replace board members or in launch an unsolicited takeover bid. Uh, another type of, you know, issuer protection that could be uh, negotiated for our lockup agreements. This is where the investor would agree to not sell its securities off of the issuer. Um, obviously, the car votes could be negotiated. Um, and then also, like, what's the term for these agreements? So both the standstill and lockups, the parties would need to decide how long these protections stand in, stay in place. We, we typically see these about one to three years. But there could also be a, a mechanism set up where the securities can, like, for, in a lockup situation, could be slowly released gradually over multiple like stages of termination. So, you know, the, rather than having the whole block released at once, you could actually 
cause the, the investor to only be able to release certain portions of their ownership over a period of time. Uh, that you could also potentially restrict the investor from selling their securities to certain types of other people. So you may not want them selling to a competitor or you don't want them selling to another significant shareholder of the issuer. As Gessa kind of alluded to, you know, strategic investors may also want to negotiate special rates. Um, you know, if they're perhaps a customer, um, they may ask, you know, for certain rights. In it. Like, for example, let's use mining. Um, they may want to negotiate an offtake agreement where the company grants the investor a right to purchase an agreed quantity of production from a mineral, pro mineral project of that issuer on agreed to pricing in advance. Um, or they may, you know, seek a right to acquire direct interest in one of the issuer's underlying mine uh, mineral projects. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think you can get a sense from all of this that, you know, maybe we were a little disingenuous in saying the benefit is is speed and simplicity. If you're if you're actually, you know, essentially negotiating a strategic partnership on a, on a on a mine or, or for a mining company, there are a lot of a lot of rights that are going to be on the list that uh, the company and the investor needs to think about. And also think about what they're going to look like if you're living with them two, three years down the road. And is that is that still going to be fair and reasonable? Is that still going to give the company you know, sufficient flexibility to, to make sort of corporate decisions of a strategic nature without this new partner sort of mucking it up um, either tactically uh, or, or inadvertently? So while... Uh, you know, a, a straight vanilla pipe is a, is is quick and easy to relative to say a sale of the company. If you're going to add all the bells and whistles, it does require some pretty careful uh, consideration of, of of how that um, web of of rights interacts. You know, down the road as as the company may evolve. Totally, definitely agree. Now let's go to the, the, the legal stuff, <laughs> regulatory requirements. Um, so as mentioned previously, the pipe transactions are typically implemented through a private placement, relying on a prospectus exemption under the applicable securities laws in Canada. Um, frequently the issuers will rely on the accredited investor exemption. These are usually, essentially the investor has to meet certain criteria of accredited investor. They're usually high wealth individuals or large institutions or sophisticated investors of some sort, um, or they rely on the minimum amount exemption. So the investors. Sorry, can we skip the slide? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Nope. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was looking at. Um, and then uh, when you, under securities laws in Canada, if you issue securities pursuant to one of these exemptions, typically resale restrictions will apply on the issued security. Um, these are usually about four months and a day after the distribution date. Um, so unless you, the investor can rely on another exemption or the same exemption with the new investor. A pipe transaction will likely be deemed a material change of the issuer under securities laws. Therefore, they're gonna have to issue a press release um, to the public, you know, providing the disclosure of the pipe transaction, and then we'll have to file a material change report 10 days after the date the change occurs. Um, usually a material change is deemed to be the date where the, the board of directors has decided that the, the transaction is probable. So usually it's the date where you're signing the definitive agreement. Um, the investor also needs to think about their regulatory filing requirements that may be triggered with uh, the pipe transaction. So if the investor is gonna be ending up acquiring more than 10% of the issuer on an aggregate basis, um, the investor will you know, likely trigger the early warning requirements and then have to file an early warning report. Um, they will also be deemed an insider of the issuer and have to start doing insider filings and thinking about the insider trading rules um, under the exchange. We'll get more into those regulations and requirements. You know, they may have to file a PIP, a personal information filing as required by TSX. Also, you're still not being removed from, again, it's still the securities laws regime still on you with the, the, the pipe transaction. So and if an investor is considered a control person and triggers that, you know, resale restrictions may even be more stringent 
And, you know, if there's any further acquisitions of, of that control person of that issuer, they may be subject to certain takeover bid requirements. So all of these need to be still considered when you're, you're, you're conducting a pipe transaction not removed from this, these regimes. And then you need to think about things outside of securities law. There's other regulatory um, acts that we need to be thinking about, depending on the size of the pipe transaction and the number of securities being acquired, among other considerations. You know, the Investment Canada Act may be triggered if the investor is a non-Canadian. Um, so they may have some review, notification, or approval rights. As well, the Competition Bureau, Bureau may have some under the Competition Act, some review, notification, and review rights. If, like, for example, it's a strategic um, investor who's operating in the same business as that issuer, or even if it's a, the investor is a private equity firm who has, you know, control over a portfolio company that's operating in the same business as the issuer. So th those, yeah. you know, regimes and, also... And I believe there's them. another s seminar in the series on national security and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So you do need to factor these in, uh, but... Uh, I would say that a, a pipe transaction doesn't raise the alarm bells from the Investment Canada review. And, and we have seen a lot of state-owned enterprises active, obviously in mining, particularly out of China. And, and, a, and in light of this sort of enhanced scrutiny that we're seeing right now, that a pipe might be the bridge uh, to get parties you know, together to be able to do deals where an outright sale or otherwise may be, may be impossible. So, so while you do need to factor it in, it, it, those things can actually be factors pushing one towards a pipe transaction as opposed to a, a change of control transaction. Thank you. Yes. And then also, you know, the corporate governance approvals are still there and they're ever present in any, you know, major transaction that a company does. So a board of director approval will likely be required since this involves issuance of securities and it's likely outside of the ordinary course of business. Um, but you also, the issuer needs to look at, you know, whether they have any shareholder rights plans or other kind of shareholder agreements that may, you know, have rights in there that are triggered by the transaction that they need to either get the consents from the shareholder or group of shareholders and majority shareholders or get waivers. Uh, likewise, you need to be thinking about third party approvals and, and whether they're required or you need to get some waivers. You know, uh, an issuer should be looking at their credit facilities their loan agreements with lenders and seeing if there's any restrictions on doing this type of transaction where they have to get the lender's consent or get a waiver. Um, and maybe there's other investor agreements just like this that you need to go back and make sure there's no preemptive rights. There's no other rights that you need to get waivers from or approvals from in order to do this uh, pipe transaction. The, the big area of regulatory approvals kind of come from more of the, you know, the exchange rules. That's kind of the regime that you really need to be thinking about with the pipe transaction. Um, so you need to think about which exchanges the shares that are being, the securities are being issued on or the underlying securities are, are listed on. And those rules need to be a, a complied with as well. So using the TSX, um, the TSX approval is going to be required by a reporting issuer um, for a pipe transaction. Um, one of the big ones that they're going to, you need to think about is pricing. So they have the TSX has discount rules on what how far a discount on the market price for the pricing terms. Otherwise, they're going to likely require you to get shareholder approval. So just if you look at the, the slide in front of you, we've included the chart on the discount rules. Um, essentially, the TSX provides the price per listed security issued under the private placement may not generally be lower than the market price, less the applicable discount shown on the chart. Market price is the VWAP, which is the volume weighted average price of the calculate on the five trading days immediately preceding the relevant date um, on the TSX for those securities or whatever other exchange the majority of the trading volume is. And then value of the listed security occurring at that time. So looking at the chart, if you know the market price is below 50 cents, there's a maximum 25% discount. So above 50 cents, below $2, max of 20% discount and above $2 is a maximum 15% discount. The relevant date for determining the pricing rules is going to be the date either the party and parties entered into that definitive agreement being like usually the subscription agreement or the date that the issuer chooses to file a price protection form. Uh, why would an issuer do this? This is where the parties have, you know, nailed down the pricing terms, but they have are still figuring out all those other terms that, you know, Gessa said, you know, can take time if you want all the bells and whistles. So you're 
working with the parties to get, you know, investor rights and maybe getting some issuer protections, but you already have pricing set. You can, the issuer can actually go to the TSX, get that reservation in place while they still finish the definitive agreement, like negotiated terms before they are in a position to even sign it. Um, for convertible securities, the conversion price will be subject to the same pricing rules. Uh, but how you apply the conversion price is available in a couple ways. The parties can either, you know, choose the market price less the applicable discount at either the time of the issuance of the convertible security or the time the conversion of the security actually occurs. You can't just have a pick and choose and do the lesser of. The parties would have to decide this. Alternatively, the parties can have a, the lower of market price without a discount at the time of the issuance of the convertible security or the time of the conversion of the security. In the case of warrants, um, they cannot be less than the market price of the underlying security determined at the date of the definitive agreement or a future date that they decide and they put in the definitive agreement. What the parties need to also be mindful of if they're going to grant some anti-dilution rights and protections. Um, there are lots of guidelines and rules on that in the TSX as well. So the parties need to be mindful that they're not step overstepping or doing anything prohibitive there. So the TSX, will, as I mentioned, will likely require shareholder approval if you do not comply with these discount rules and the pricing rules of the TSX. There's a couple other circumstances that the TSX will likely require shareholder approval. Um, if the total number of shares issuable at a discount are greater than the 25% 20, of the issued outstanding shares of that issuer, um, shareholder approval will likely be requested by the TSX. Um, also, if the pipe may materially affect control of the issuer as determined by the TSX, then shareholder approval will likely be required. Um, this is typically seen to be meaning, you know, 20% or more of ownership of the issuer or, you know, an ability to, you know, for that investor to influence the vote of shareholders uh, following the pipe transaction, including blocking transactions. So if there's any other exchanges where these shares are listed, each exchange has their own kind of pipe requirements that need to be complied with. So this includes the TSXV, the NEO exchange, the Canadian Securities Exchange, they all have their own rules around pipe transactions and requirements. So make sure that you're looking at those requirements if they're relevant to your securities that are being issued. Next slide. So pipe transactions typically follow the same path or process and have like a similar checklist to get to closing. Uh, the main first stage is kind of the pre-announcement stage. This is where the, you know, an NDA or confidentiality agreement may be entered into, exclusivity arrangements are agreed to, uh, the due diligence process kicks off for the investor and its advisors. Uh, and this is where the, you know, the heavy lifting happens. This is where the negotiation of the, the transaction happens. So this is where you negotiate the definitive agreement, usually a subscription agreement um, and any key ancillary agreements that may tie on to that, as well as the securities terms, in particular, like the, you know, the convertible debentures. Um, what these green, the definitive agreement would typically have are the same kind of provisions we see in any acquisition agreement. So the investor will likely want reps and warranties from the issuer on their business and operations and the capitalization. And then on the other hand, the issuer is going to want to get from the investor reps and warranties that they meet the prospectus exemption criteria so that the investor is saying that they're, they, they are a credit investor. Um, so those kind of those kind of agree promises, factual promises need to be put into the subscription agreement are definitely re requested. Uh, other top common provisions are the interim covenants, the interim period running from the execution of the agreement to the closing. So often the investor wants the issuer to say they're going to carry on the business in the orient course. They're not going to be like issuing securities and getting into debt arrangements without a consent and notifying the investor. Uh, both parties will often agree to mutual covenants, you know, further assurances to work towards closing, to facilitate the closing, get those approvals that are required, everything necessary to get to the closing. Uh, that consists of closing conditions. The parties will have some mutual closing conditions, but they'll also have their own list. So things that they want to see happen or get before they, 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 complete, the they complete the transactions and complete the investment. Termination provisions are important 
provision to be negotiated. How do we get out of this transaction before closing? So the parties will want to put some thought to that as well indemnification provision. So if a party misreps or breaches one of their covenants, um, what's the remedy and what's the survival period for those indemnities? The terms of the securities are negotiated this time as well. So if they're the convertible to venture, what kind of terms are apply to it? And that would be like a form of that debenture would be then attached to the subscription agreement. Uh, similarly, any of the investor rights we spoke about or issuer protections, they can either be like actually embedded into the subscription agreement, or they can alternately be in some ancillary documents that agreements that then would be, and that are standalone, but would be attached as a form to the subscription agreement when it's signed, and then would be a closing condition to be executed and delivered at closing. Once we have everything kind of settled on the terms, this is where we get into the announcement. So remember that it's likely a material change that's gonna be triggered. The, the deal's gonna to have to be announced to the public. This, the agreement's executed, like the subscription agreement. And then this is where you're getting all those approvals that are required to get the transaction closed, so getting those stock exchange approvals, getting the regulatory approvals, getting any share all approvals that are required. Once all the kind of closing conditions are like lined up, that's when we get into the closing stage. So the closing stage is where, yes, the closing conditions are essentially satisfied. We're delivering all those ancillary standalone documents in escrow. The securities are going to be issued and the subscription price is going to be delivered by the investor. So everything's kind of delivered at once and then agreed to be released at once. And that's when the closing happens. Lastly, if things, your work's not done, post-closing, there's going to be some regulatory filings. So if you're relying on the accredited investor exemption, for example, under the applicable securities laws that you have to, you know, provide some post-closing filings as well. You need to be thinking that the issuer might be, the investor may now be an insider and they may have to do some filings. So you need to be thinking about all those regulatory filings post-closing. Yeah, just back on that last slide, we, we had a question ahead of time, a little bit on due diligence. So maybe we can deal with that now since it's up on the screen. So, you know, it, it'll, it will depend. If, 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 for example, your pipe investor is already an, an, invested, an existing investor, pardon me, uh, it may be very limited due diligence. And then there's issues if you have, for example, a financial or strategic who's thinking a bunch of different options, is interested in your company, they may not want to be in a position where they're in possession of, 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 of non-public material information. So you, you, you may, in that NDA or in a separate side letter, be negotiating around that and and that you know the parties are sophisticated and, and they're not relying on anything, but also that the, the issuer may be required to disclose that information down the road so that the, the recipient isn't forever sort of burdened with non-public non information. Uh, so that, that's a bit of a nuance and a subtlety, but since there was the question on due diligence, uh, you know, the answer is it does depend and it may involve a, a separate track of, of discussions and, and consideration. So, so that's, that's sort of the due diligence question. Um, anything else, Nicole, or should we get No, I think we that? should uh, take the group through uh, our pipe right. study. Let's do it. Okay, well, the, the, I, I can tell on the webinar, everyone's warmed up and excited. <laughs> uh, so here we go, here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about the deal point study. So ne next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, we're gonna. This has not been published yet. You're you're getting the hot copy. Um, that you know it pays to be here. You're gonna you're gonna get the results of our second annual uh, deal uh, study on pipes in Canada. Um, the, the the study itself will be available. The old study is available already on our website, and uh, this this year's study will be up soon. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time. On, on, on this slide, and you might be asking why bother? Uh, there's not all that much information on it, but, but I think it's important. And, it, and it's important this way, the, these deal studies, and there's a whole bunch of them, not on pipes, we think this is an original sort of work, but you can see them in the M&A context for sure. Uh, some law firms do them. The American Bar Association does a great one, a, a variety of them, both in the US and uh, the Canadian market, and, and there's a lot of data out there, and they're great tools, but they have their limits. 
And, and one, one of the ways to understand their limits is to really understand what's in the sample. And the data in any of these studies is, is far from perfect. I'd say the public m and studies are the best, but anything else uh, for a variety of reasons, you're sort of stuck with what you can get. And that's very much the case in our study. So I don't want to downplay it. Um, it's the best that we could do. And it's certainly better than just sort of hunch or anecdotal one lawyer's personal experience. Um, but there are some real limits. So looking at the slide, we can see uh, we only have 15 deals to look at. Uh, I don't have a statistics background. I'm just going to assume that's statistically significant, but that, that's all we have. Um, the prior year, we were able to get 19. And so, so how do we get this? Well, we set some criteria. We said we want them to be at least $10 million in size in terms of the, the, the transaction. Um, they need to have the characteristics that Nicole walked you through. So we're not looking at just any private placement. It's, it's those deals where it's a limited investor group and where these other rights are present. Um, just not a straight up sale of securities to, you know, under a prospectus exemption. And we, we used some third party uh, resources to, to get the initial list. And there were more deals, but then we have to be able to actually get the data. And, and while you think this is material um, information and so under a material change report, all the documents would get filing, filed, that isn't necessarily the case. So we then have to scrub it down to where we can get either the actual transaction agreements, that's what we prefer, or you know, a very detailed material change report that you know, maybe some of the documents are filed, maybe they're not, you know, just enough so that we can get information so that we can, we can fill out our forms, if you will, and collect the data. The data. So, so that, that, that's sort of the headline. It's a relatively small sample size, but it's the best sample we could get. Um, not on the slide. I can give you a, a bit of detail on the size of the deal. So in, in 2020, in the latest study, the average uh, deal size was 104 million. So pretty significant. Uh, the smallest was 12.5 and the largest was uh, almost 800 million. So, so really meaningful. Um, and that actually reflected larger deals in terms of average in the highs than what we saw the prior year. So, you know, if you had asked me a year ago, I, I would have thought we would have seen a lot more deals. That's not what we've got here because of the distressed environment that we anticipated. And uh, you know, I would have guessed probably the sizing would have trended downwards, but that's, that's not what we saw. Um, in, in part, I think, because notwithstanding the real human and personal loss and costs associated with COVID, the, the economy, uh, apart from some really hard hit sectors, seem to get through things okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So, so it's been a very interesting year. Um, in terms of the percentage acquired, um, the range was from a, a small around 2% of the target was the size of the placement to up to over a third. Um, so so quite, quite, a, quite a wide range uh, in terms of, of what the pipe meant to, to the issuer. So with that, maybe we can, that's a bit of a sense of the, of, the, of, the, of the sample. If we can go to the next slide, please. All right, so, you know, some, some trends that, that we, we saw, it was, you know, there were more deals this year that were straight up common equity. Uh, again, I, I probably would have guessed there'd be convertible debt or prefs that are providing investors more sort of downside protection. Um, but we didn't, we didn't see that. Um, the registration rights were in about half the deals. And I think that touches a bit on the control block. We saw the lar some large things and the ability to just move your position in an efficient and organized manner. Um, you know, anti-dilution, information and voting rights are still there. And, and I don't know that we talked a lot about the vote, the information rights, but that's something more than your quarterly disclosures that 
And that can get, you know, to monthly management reports or in a, in a, and for a mining company and maybe other technical information that is made available to, to the investors. Um, and one thing that really changed was in the prior year, and again, this almost talks more about this issuer friendly environment was we had seen, you know, a real decrease where the um, redemption rights at the option of the investor, where you can sort of get out of the investment really fell to a to really small number. So, you know, at a high level, a bit different than what I certainly would have predicted was, you know, at a, a headline would be that for this past year, there were fewer pipes, uh, and, you know, and the terms actually tended to favor the issuers. So interesting, uh, you know, from what I, I thought was going to happen. I don't know, Nicole, if you had any comment on that or. Oh, definitely. I, I, I thought we'd see more. Like, I'm surprised that we, we saw less pipe transactions this year. I know it's yeah. not a huge difference, but I, I thought we'd see more. And again, some of that can be, can be because of the risk that we have to be able to get the information. Um, but, but that, uh, you know, the results in terms of issuer friendly uh, sort of is what it is. What it is. Um, so, uh, we can jump down right into some of the, you know, the, we'll get into the nitty gritty on the results. Uh, so I think it's two slides down, please. Okay. Thank you. So uh, a little bit on uh, residents of investor, where, where is the, you know, the people putting the money in, where are they from? Um, and the light, we'll call it pink, uh, red, red is 2019. Uh, pink is 2020. So um, a, a decrease uh, of Canadian investors. So we're seeing some more foreign investors putting money in. So from 58% Canadian down to 40%. Uh, the U.S. takes up the bulk of that difference. We have a bigger influx of, of U.S. investors there. Uh, and, and, and also the Europeans dropped and filled, up, filled out with other um, so uh, I guess more international uh, is one way of thinking about who we're seeing the money come in from. Uh, in terms of exchanges, TSX is still still the, the main exchange in Canada and where most of the pipe deals in our survey came from. Um, uh, but an increase on sort of TSX Visa or junior issuers. Uh, and we didn't get any on the CSC uh, this past year that doesn't mean they didn't happen, but just make it into our study. So again, if you're, if you're, well, hopefully if you're involved in a pipe, you'll be working with Faskin, but you know, if for some reason you, you, you make the mistake and, or we're conflicted out and this study gets shoved in your face and you don't like the answer, you know, you can use some of these stats to sort of distinguish them away uh, and try to negotiate the deal that you think makes sense for you. Uh, and then, we have, a, we have a question. I don't know if we want to just jump to it quickly. Yeah. Not, well, I'm a bit of a Luddite. Can some, how do I? Yeah, it says, what are registration rights? So um, thank you, oh. Doug, for sending us that question. Essentially, it's where a corporation enters into an arrangement with an investor to grant them you know, certain rights to participate in a public offering of the equity securities by the corporation. It's, it's allowed to have some liquidity because when you're issuing securities, in one of these like prospectus exempt ways, there's resale restrictions. So not e they're not just easily transferable. Yeah, they, it, 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 it's a prospectus right. It, we call yeah. it registration rights, comes from the US where they file their registration statement, but it, it really is a requirement of the issuer to file a prospectus. And its most basic form would be, I pipe investor have $20 million of shares in your company, and I want to sell them and I want to sell them in an organized way uh, through a prospectus and whether the control block rules are relevant or not, it, it, it requires that. And then you can negotiate around that. Who's going to pay all the fees? Uh, is it a tag along or piggyback where say the company's already filing a prospectus? Can you stick your shares on top of that? Anyway, there's negotiation around that, but that answers the question in terms of what we're talking about when we talk about a registration right. Um, so back to the slide at hand, uh, you know, materials is where mining is going to get um, lumped in. 
and energy. So like the Canadian economy, it's dominated, uh, you know, pipe deals in those sectors. Um, and, you, you know, that's sort of, we saw some real estate come in and some IT as, as well. Um, you know, looking in my notes here, just a little bit more on the sample, the average market capitalization of the target was 1.8 billion. Uh, and the smallest was, was 25 million and the, the largest was 9.5. So you're seeing it along the full spectrum of Canadian capital markets from our, you know, a lot of our smaller issuers to, to some pretty serious uh, large size issuers at nine and a half billion dollars. Uh, next slide, please. I'm also mindful of time here. Uh, okay, so um, we saw a, an increase in equity. I mentioned that at the beginning, an increase in preferred, uh, convertible preferred, but a real drop in the, uh, in, the, in the debt, which again is a surprise to me, figuring this past year would have been a, a distressed environment. Um, but that was not what we saw. Uh, what we saw in in the in the data. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, redemption rights is interesting. So that is, you know, can the issuer uh, get rid of you? if you're the investor or if you're the investor, can you kind of push back your, your investment? And so um, in terms of, the, from the company perspective, uh, what we see is about a third of the deals provide a right. And it's usually associated, I think this makes sense when you think back of what the type of security is, is it uh, you know, convertible pref deals or convertible debt? Um, you know, and it's quite common in a convertible debt, and that's just often the case of a, of a debt instrument, and about 20% uh, were in the PREF shares. Um, and then the slide here doesn't show that data, but what it shows is when, when this right can be exercised. So less common uh, in 2020 for it to be at any time, um, less common even for a specific time frame. Um, but generally on the occurrence of, of certain events is, is when this would, would, would occur. Um, you know, and it may be meeting a, a, a you know, performance threshold, either a financial covenant or you know, a, share, a share performance type of, type of threshold. And much less common for the ability of uh, investors to be able to push their investment back to the company. So next slide, please. So board rights, uh, you know, this, this is one of the key distinguishers, uh, you know, that this, you know, the investors put a meaningful amount of money uh, into the business. And one of the things they want to be able to do is actively monitor that investment. Um, and they have the right to put one or more people uh, on, on the board itself. So that was in, um, you know, a third of the deals, in 2020, which was down from the prior year. Uh, and, you know, why that is, 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 you know, I think obviously somewhat reflecting the relative bargaining power. It may also be that people are, uh, investors aren't as keen on having uh, a board member on for various reasons, uh, you know, director liability um, and the, issues around, you know, director nominees, there's an inherent tension uh, because, it, you know, particularly where, where the investor's interests may differ from other shareholders. Now, from day to day, it, it, it probably shouldn't. Uh, but, you know, when those conflicts arise, it puts the director nominee in a very difficult uh, position. Uh, the, the law in Canada is fairly clear that their duties are to the company, period, and not to their, uh, you know, their nominator. And, and that, that may not be a position that's tenable to either the investor or that, or that nominee. Uh, you know, as an aside, an important 
point to consider if you're engaging in a, in a pipe transaction in, or any transaction where you're getting investor rights is just to remember that, you know, what can happen with confidential information received by that nominee uh, needs to be thought about and probably put into your transaction agreements. Uh, it, is, it is not the case uh, that it is obviously true as a legal matter that the nominee would have the right to share that information back at the mothership. Um, you know, arguments around uh, implied consent and like, well, duh, of course they can. That's why they're on the board in the first place. Uh, may well not uh, stand up in court. And so you'd want to make sure that your agreements would, would deal with that uh, you know, so not just information rights, but how, how the, no, the director nominee can, can use that information and share it uh, back up, up top. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I mean, what is interesting is these rules of thumb sort of develop. <laughs> and it's like, if you have 10%, you get one director. If you have 20%, you can kind of see it there. Uh, you can, I can't point very well on the web, but you kind of get two. And if you have 30%, you kind of have three nominees. Um, and it usually falls away that time. So, you know, if people are fighting over what the thresholds are, maybe this study can be helpful just to put an end to it. And, and in that case, go with market, because I'm not sure there's a more principled reason to, to change it. I mean, the one that I sometimes would raise is just, you know, my percent ownership should reflect my percent of the directors. Uh, and, and this seems to suggest a, a 10 member board if, if that holds true. I'm not sure it always does. Uh, so next slide, please. Just checking that time here. Uh, so yeah, so voting rights. Uh, so so this, is, this is less issuer friendly, notwithstanding some of the other data points that we've seen is you know, you're giving specific approval rights to one investor over fundamental transactions in 40% of deals. And that, that's sort of the big change we saw in our, in our data set. But otherwise, you know, dividends around the same year to year, 11, 13%, you know, the, the ability to issue more debt, 16, 13%. Uh, you know, I guess issuance of equity, quite a large change there from zero to 7% in issuance of other securities. So it seems while, you know, the companies had it better on a lot of points, they, they did need to sort of give up a bit more uh, rights to their investor in 2020 than, than we, saw, we saw previously. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot of data uh, on this slide. Um, you know, the, the, the survey will be available. Um, but you, let's look at dilution protection. So a big change in sort of far fewer instances of preemptive rights. Uh, and, you know, so that is certainly issuer friendly. Preemptive rights uh, can be a real headache from an issuer's perspective, uh, you know, particularly if the business is going pretty well and, and you need some careful drafting about how you deal with things like a bot deal and you got, you know, you got to go to your investor and, and do they have a ROFO or a ROFER and, and how that works, uh, you know, in the very much the real time constraints associated with a bot deal, uh, you know, so can you carve out bot deals altogether or, or do you just try to put around a mechanism that works there? Um, but we saw a big decrease in that, um, you know, other anti-dilution protections, the types that Nicole walked us through uh, fell dramatically. Uh, registration rights, so this uh, prospectus uh, right type of is still in about half of deals. It was a decrease, but they're, they're still quite prevalent. Yes, Doug. Do you think that the, the fall in anti-dilution protection is really just tied to the type of security that we're seeing in, in 2020? Like, it seemed like we were getting yes. more common, yeah, right? Point. So like, why, why would, you know, anti-dilution protections are not as, as relevant, right? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um Standstill, so the standstill might be the single most important clause you negotiate if you're a mining company and you're bringing in, let's say you're a, you're a mid-sized junior miner and you're bringing in a, 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 you know, one of the, one of the big, big companies to partner with. Think through that standstill, 
you know, very carefully how long it lasts, when it falls away, what they can and can't do, um, you know, because there are, there are some, without naming names, some, some good examples in the history of mining where one company thought they were bringing in, you know, a strategic partner and the, the big investor was making a strategic investment and that, that outlook and approach is very different and, and how that manifests itself down the road, uh, you know, m- maybe a frustration to both parties if they don't have a alignment up front as to what, what's really happening. You know, information rights, still about half the deals down a little bit. Um, we don't distinguish in this data whether, you know, in the 53% example, if a bunch of them were just the same as your regular reporting, the fact that you even have the right probably isn't doing all that much. So the fact that the number came down a bit as a practical matter may not suggest that, you know, pipe investors in 2020 are receiving a lot less information. Uh, and lumped in there, which we don't break out, and maybe if we were going to do a mining special on the study, we could talk about whether there's technical or, or other data data in there. Uh, the next point on the lockups is about, you know, this this. Uh, restriction. So uh, I don't know that we talked about the four month hold, but that's your general restriction for a private placement under Canadian securities law. You know, is there a separate uh, contractual obligation that you won't part with the uh, securities for a longer time frame? And that was only in 20% of deals, perhaps more relevant in these real strategic partnerships that we've been alluding to. And then the other business right so stand still. So information rights and um, Nicole, I'm, I'm working now. Yeah, you're working. You're good. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a symbol. <laughs> okay. Ready? All right. Great. Uh, apologies. Um, so on information rights, the difference between um, 53 and, and 40 may may not be as dramatic as it as it appears because we we don't dive into that data and and see that maybe a bunch of the rights in the 53 were just your normal quarterly reporting types. Uh, so what you're actually giving up is, is nothing, but it would impact our, our data set. Um, we also, if we were to do a mining special, might try to look at if some of these rights were at the you know property level or mining or technical data. Um, and maybe that's something we can do for next year. Uh, lockups, a slight uh, decrease. Well, it's a, it's a almost 50% down from 32 to 20, but still in less than half of deals. And this is a restriction above securities law, which in Canada would be four months for a private placement where the where the investor agrees not to to part with their securities. Again, important in the sort of a strategic partnership arrangement. And then on other business rights. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, from 53 to 33 says people were doing more and more straight up just investments and not negotiating these other rights. And as we talked about at the front end, you know, I think if you included pipe deal, uh, SPAC deals in the and if you look in U.S. data, you're going to see a drop more. But they really are, I think, sort of a, a unique animal and they would introduce noise into those data sets. So um, if we could go to the next slide, we'll, we will talk a little bit more specifics on those other types of, of rights that get negotiated, some of which we've talked about already. Uh, the redemption right we talked about before, uh, dilution protection. This is really just a summary. Board nomination rights, a big drop. Uh, we talked about this and perhaps why that's the case. Uh, those issues around nominee directors, voting rights went up, uh, re- prospectus slash registration rights holding still, stand still by way of summary, you know, falling a little bit, information right falling a little bit, lockups falling a bit, and the in other ancillary falling a little bit. So that's really just a graphical representation of what we've seen on the, on the last book. Um, last page, pardon me. So uh, Outlook, uh, you know, I, I think I've explained uh, in the past, I sort of got it wrong last year. Uh, and, um, you know, we thought we would see a lot more deals. Uh, 
you know, the reason we frankly rushed out to do the first ever Canadian study was, you know, we, COVID was on the horizon and we thought, okay, this, this is going to make a lot of sense uh, to help people bridge, uh, bridge their financing needs in a period of downturn and tremendous uncertainty. Maybe, maybe that's still true again um, for, for 2021. Uh, you know, the, we, we, Nicole went over the benefits of pipes, so I think they will remain around, but whether we see a big uptick or not, hard, hard to predict. Um, you know, as deal lawyers, we always like to say there'll be more deals because uh, that's what we like to do. But I, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, private equity and financial investors still have a lot of money to deploy. So maybe they'll, they'll come in with more pipes. The U.S. saw a big uptick, but a lot of that was these SPACs. Um, and so that's, I don't know, what's your crystal ball saying, Nicole, what do you, what do you think we're going to see, uh, for, for this coming year? I think we're going to start seeing more. I feel like the, the M&A and just general transactions and, you know, financings all kind of kicked off late last year. So I think just there was like a little slowing with COVID and pandemic, but then everyone was just like back kind of to business. So I think the kind of predictions we had, for last year with pipes and you know the kind of how they're useful in, in a you know a pandemic situation where maybe issuers are more financially distressed, maybe we will see those kind of predictions come out next this year now because you know everyone is not as afraid. There is all that dry capital, you know, everyone's been saying is sitting around. So maybe this is where we're gonna see the the pipe transactions really kick off this year in Canada. Yeah, so we'll see. And and if we can jump down. Uh, the slides, we're gonna, we'll talk a little bit, we'll just touch on mining. And then uh, we, have, we have, I think we're going to have some time for a few questions. And I see there's one, uh, we'll try to figure out the technology here when we get to that. So, so you know, on, on mining, you know, we've talked about the pros and cons. Uh, we talked about the ability to, you know, whether there's an off take, uh, whether there's, you know, specific approvals at the mine level, at the asset level, um, you know, you could, you could have a, a row for uncertain assets, you know, you, you could really bespoke the, the deal that, that makes sense. And, you know, my sense of where they're going to be particularly relevant is either you're bringing in a real strategic partner that you want to have beside you uh, and, or that, someone would really like to buy you and that someone frankly is a state owned enterprise who's going to be subject to really close scrutiny as we saw, uh, you know, in the, in the TMAC deal, may, maybe, maybe a pipe is the way out the way through, or, or at least an interim measure until you can, you can think through, you know, some of the investment Canada type of issues uh, and, and sort of gauge that. So, I mean, I, I think that's, the case and and you know we saw in the data ahead of time you know a big portion of pipes are my are in the mining space so i think that will that will continue to be the case uh nicole i don't know if you have any any other thoughts on that no i think that's right i think that's right okay uh so i think next slide and then we go to questions yeah we cover most of this but Okay. Okay. I'm looking at the chat. People are just telling me I froze. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm a late on that. Okay. Q and A. We got one. Okay. So one question was, what are the potential disadvantages of a pipe transaction? Uh, you know, I think we 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 talked through that, and maybe I've alluded to is is uh, you, you maybe if you haven't thought through and sort of played how it all works out forward, you, you may be putting on handcuffs on the company that you didn't think you were. Uh, and so that, you know, if, if you're gonna be, if you're just gonna issue 10% of your float to a strategic investor and you can put restraints on them and it's common shares and it's looking a little bit like the 2020 data set, you can probably get going. Mm -hmm. But if you're, from the issuer's perspective, needing to provide a, a, the, the full panoply of ancillary rights, just slow down and make sure you're not 
effectively selling the company without a control premium and without providing a liquidity event. I mean, that's a little bit of a stark characterization, but you could end up in something along those lines. So I'd say that that's the potential, potential downside. Uh, is there a limit to the number of per, uh, purchasers that may participate in a pipe transaction? Uh, no, but you won't make it into our study if you have uh, <laughs> if you have too many, and then we'll just call it a private placement. Uh, so that's that's, that's the uh, risk. <laughs> yeah, that's the risk. You, 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 wouldn't, want, you wouldn't want to do that because we need we need a we robust, need your data. <laughs> yeah, we need a robust data set. Cool. <laughs> Um, okay, what type of confidential information and standstill? So we talked about that, I think already, it could be a full, it could be a full sort of data room worth of information, it may be just some update, it may be you just deal with, do it on the public disclosure. Uh, you know, and that may be a function of price, it may be a function of time, it may be a function of the investors desire to remain clean and be able to move out of the, the transaction as soon as, as soon as the sort of hold period would be over. So I mean, they don't have a prospectus, right? Um, can you explain, this one's in the chat, at price protection a bit more. Uh, not sure what comment we were talking about. So there's price protection at the basic level on uh, you know, if you think of any private placement, when we think of price protection, it's getting that, you know, talking to the exchange right away to lock in whatever discount you would have uh, in issuing the, the shares subject to the limits that Nicole walked us through. Um, you know, there, there could be protection in a way through the conversion and other features uh, or you know, on the on the pref share, there's sort of protection in that way where you have a preference to the, you know, just corporate sort of structure 101, like, you know, debt is the most protected in a downside scenario, then your pref share, then your common share. Um, so I, I, I hope we're answering that. Nicole, I don't know if you had anything. That's, that's what I thought the question was going towards, yeah. Okay. Um, Periods of resale restrictions. Yeah, so four, four, month, four month hold is the normal. I think in our data, we saw, you know, lockups really wouldn't be much more than a year. That would be, you know, six months to a year is what our data is showing in terms of what additional sort of contractual hold that uh, an investor might, might agree to. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, we've got... Well, we're, we're almost at time and I, I don't want to just ramble on for the sake of rambling on. We're, we're through our presentation. Your time is valuable. I'll let Nicole say a few words, but I want to thank you for, for joining us. Uh, and, and the study will be available soon uh, on our website. But if you want the prior years and, and in fact, the 2019 study includes sort of the legal nuts and bolts as well which we won't repeat for 2020. So it's available uh, already. So thank you and Nicole. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us. And you know, if you've got have any pipe transaction questions, feel free to reach out to Guest RI or anyone from the Securities m and team at Baskin and we'd be more than happy to assist you with that. Thanks. Thank you.